Anyway, um, I'm just going to say, say very a few things about where my ideas come from, the influences I have. And it's only a half an hour lecture, so I'm going to have to rush through a lot of uh, images. Uh, so I might not be able to talk about everything. But uh, just very few things. My very first influence was my dad. When I was seven years old, he taught me my first painting, drawing uh, classes. Uh, color theory and how to sketch, uh, because he's an artist who uh, went to art school, but he didn't make a living as an artist. He eventually got a job uh, in the central bank in Mexico, which is the mint, that's where they make the money. And he got a job as a criminalist inside the bank. Uh, they have that internal security because that's one of the few institutions in Mexico where um, they cannot get corrupted. They cannot afford corruption there uh, because they print the money. And uh, so uh, my dad had the museum of crime in his office, all these forgeries all around. And uh, had great stories. Um, one of my favorite stories was a French uh, a forger who, uh, in France, he was forging uh, francs at the time. Uh, francs, he did Moroccan money. Then uh, he was arrested there, then left France after he was released, went to Mexico. In Mexico, he was forging dollar bills. He was forging Mexican pesos, Venezuelan, Cuban, everything. The Mexican police had about 10 years uh, to, catch, to catch him, and the only way they caught him was because uh, the, his name was San Pietro, uh, although he was French. Um, he left his girlfriend in France, and she was really mad at him. And she's the one who contacted the Mexican police, and they arrested him. And uh, then my dad had to interview him when he was in jail, uh, just to understand why did he do it. And um, they asked him, you know, you went to art school, you well trained. Um, and, um, and the guy said, well, uh, you know, also he came from wealthy families. He didn't need to do any forgeries. So the guy said, well, I just did it for the thrills. And uh, anyway, so he became very good friends with my dad somehow uh, because my dad was bringing supplies for him. And he did a portrait of my father with India ink, and it looks just like a black and white photograph. Uh, it, it, you don't even see brush work. Uh, it's just an amazing, uh, amazing story. Eventually, the, the, the art, this artist got released 10 years after, went back to France, and uh, didn't go back to the forgery business. But all this to say, all of this was an influence on me. You will see a lot of things that are look alike because I always kind of had the challenge in my mind that what if I wanted to be a forger artist, do some forgeries? <laughs> so that's one, one side. So uh, I'm gonna start with my early forgeries. So he, here's one of uh, my favorite artists from all times, um, Fra uh, Francisco Goya. And I saw his original etchings when I was a student at the San Francisco Art Institute. I saw um, a, a whole collection of the disasters of war. And um, as an assignment, we either had to write a paper or make some artwork. And I didn't want to write anything, so I went for the artwork. Um, so this is my, my version. So I was still a student back in 1983. This is called Contra el Bien General. And it was perfect for uh, a, a Ronald Reagan, who called himself a Contra when he was supporting the Contras uh, in Nicaragua. Anyway, so. So I did several pieces from, um, from Goya. This is uh, also from the disasters of war. And I like to add something contemporary, as in the previous one. Um, uh, and I wanted to mix, you know, the, the, you know, if you go to Disney World, if you recall, when you get in, they say, welcome to the happiest place on earth. And I wanted to combine that with the unhappiest place on earth, which for me is war. Here's uh, Walt Disney in 1942 with a Mickey Mouse gas mask for children. You could actually go Google uh, Mickey Mouse gas mask and you will see the actual design of, of the mask. I think it's in the Disney Museum somewhere. Um, and this was uh, my combination of both things. Um, great deeds with the dead. Um, Another one of Goya's is from a different series, from, from the, um, uh, the Caprichos, where Goya makes a satire of superstition back in Spain. And according to this superstition, uh, the, the, the teeth of uh, hanging a man will bring you good luck. So this lady is trying to pull a tooth from this guy uh, for good luck. To me, what is amazing is not the idea of uh, a good luck out of a tooth from a hanging man, but the idea that you could go out, go out of your house, look around, and see if you see somebody hanging um, <laughs> that you could get a uh, tooth from. So um, 
that's my version with sort of like um, a red fink uh, with a Mexican hat and uh, Snow White. That's another from the same series, it's from the Disasters of War. Uh, this is uh, one of the most famous etchings by Goya. Uh, the Sleep of Reason produces monsters. Except that I don't see the monsters here. Uh, they are all, you know, endangered species like the owl. Um, the bats are good for agriculture and the cats. I mean, I love cats. I have two cats that, you know, I, uh, I adore. So nothing here um, seems scary to me. So I made my own version of that. Uh, we really scary flying things like stealth bombers, um, you know, um, uh, uh, Mohawk uh, missiles, I mean, uh, helicopters, uh, Tomahawk missiles. Uh, and I just left the owls as pets, actually like good companions. Um, right on the, on the, how does this work? Oh, here, right here, my cats love to play with these red lights. Uh, right here, I have a, nu a couple of the nuclear, uh, you know, it's a nuclear plant with uh, drums with, with waste coming out of it. Um, so another thing, uh, lately, you know, I've been is dealing with issues of immigration because there is sort of like a xenophobic uh, wave since 2011. And I just uh, tried to play with that. Here is the Holy Inquisition uh, after Goya's uh, caprichos. And I don't know if you could notice in the background, um, it, well, here is Speedy Gonzalez, let me see, and, and the former uh, general attorney, which was also Gonzalez, uh, what's his first name? Alberto Gonzalez. So right here, and his doppelganger. They both got away with everything. Um, this, uh, you will see later who's doppy. Um, yeah, I, I'm not gonna say much about it. Uh, so. This is a more recent piece, and you might recognize it. Um, it it's also after the caprichos. Right, and that's sort of like, a, you know, surrounded by all these monsters that are about to get him uh, to Obama. Uh, in the Spanish uh, translation is the original from Goya, it says, you will not escape. And I don't know if you could see on the bottom, fortunately, if, if I enlarge it, it will be off the frame, but this is like a little KKK chicken just running around. Um, that's another one I did after his inauguration. And this after a French uh, engraving. And uh, if here, you know, you have like a carriage with all the horses. I did a lot of green people here because uh, Obama said he liked arugulas. So uh, I, I made an army of arugulas here. Um, uh, he's carrying the world here, so it's like Atlas. This is called Atlas and the Arugulas. And right on top is uh, Hillary Clinton with a violin, very happy. Um, his wife, Michelle Obama, and uh, Joe Biden here. Um, so, um, what I love about this uh, thing is that there is no wheels. So no matter how hard the, the, the horses are pulling, it seems like it's uh, going nowhere. <laughs> That's uh, another one I did. The head egg, uh, the, the head egg. Let me see if I could make it a little smaller. No, that's as small as it gets. And um, this is gonna be at the Metropolitan Museum in September, you're gonna see it in person. Um, it's gonna be in an exhibition called The Art of uh, the Jester. So um, I'm gonna go quickly, these are very old works of mine. These are big charcoal drawings. They're about the same size as what you see on the screen. Um, this, I did this when uh, Ronald Reagan invaded uh, Nicaragua back in 1984 uh, by an, for an exhibition that uh, was organized by Lucy Lippard. Uh, it was called uh, Art Against Intervention in Central America. So this is when he almost got cut with the Iran Contra uh, scandal. But anyway, so I'm gonna go quickly through those because um, I wanna talk about many other issues. This is George Bush's father when he invaded Panama. Um, and this is a, a, around the first uh, Persian Gulf War. So that's another of my charcoal drawings. Um, now I'm gonna talk to uh, another influences in my work. Uh, I grew up Catholic. I stopped being religious when I was about 18 years old. And I remember arguing with my mom. Uh, my mom uh, was wondering, why are you going to confess? 
And I told her, well, you are not going to confess either, Mom. And my mom would say, well, that's different. I am a woman. And I'd say, what's the, so what's the difference with that? Well, a woman should never tell her sins to any man. So, so, uh, so she won the, the argument there. But eventually, you know, I was usually really bored and... Uh, I had actually really good physics uh, teacher, uh, I mean, uh, phys you know, uh, astrophysics studies and mathematics and chemistry, and somehow I replaced uh, my beliefs for more scientific approaches. And today I am beyond being an atheist. Um, now I even doubt atheism um, because all the quantum mechanics uh, discoveries where particles could go from nowhere to somewhere. Uh, you know, I, I used to go for the Lavoisier law that, you know, nothing is created or destroyed, only transformed. Um, so I thought, oh, yeah, well, that proves that uh, there is no God. But it, eventually I, I, I discovered that we don't really know where everything is coming from and where are we going into. So I am more like an agnostic now. But in any case, uh, the religious art stuck to me in, in my head. So I, I am very iconographic and I cannot help myself. Uh, to use religious iconography as a, some of my uh, vocabulary to express all kinds of ideas. Uh, one of the most um, interesting uh, books I have read um, is uh, a book by Leo Steinberg, an art historian who did this book. It's called The Sexuality of Christ in Renaissance Art and Modern Obiblium. And the whole book is about the sexuality of Christ and it's focused on the, the point about Christ being just a human being with feelings of sexuality, you know, flesh and bones, human being. Uh, he has a whole chapter on this single painting with, uh, where, um, uh, oh, sorry, I went too far, um, where uh, you could see um, baby Jesus is actually having an erection, holding himself and kissing mom. Um, I don't know if this is the origin of uh, child molesting in some priests uh, or the church, but... Um, <laughs> I hope not, uh, but this is an amazing painting, and um, this was um, a painting by uh, Robert Campin. So it's Madonna and Child in an interior. Uh, another painting from the very same book is this one, and this is uh, done by Martin van Hemskerk, The Man of Sorrows from 1525. Uh, and. Um, I decided to use this icon when Jesse Helms was attacking the National Endowment for the Arts uh, in, back in 1991, I think, after Andres Serrano's uh, Priest Christ and the Robert Mapplethorpe uh, controversy. So I used this uh, to make a charcoal drawing that is called Not Good for Funding. So let me see if I could enlarge it. So. Um, So I'm going to um, just skip this into more of my other religious discussions I've been having. Um, and other things I do is uh, something I will explain later is uh, reverse anthropology. Uh, sometimes I think uh, what will happen if, you know, the, the, the conquest uh, would have been actually of the Aztecs uh, conquering Europe. <laughs> uh, what would have happened? Um, uh, so in this case, um, I uh, used the format of ancient books from Mexico to, to express what happened during the conquest, how indigenous cultures were uh, pretty much uh, destroyed. Here you see Columbus soldiers cutting the hands of uh, the Taino and Arawak Indians in, in um, the Caribbean. Uh, most of them just die of bleeding after uh, the cutting of their hands. The reason they cut their hands was because they put a quote of gold. The Indians have to bring gold to them. And since there is no gold in the Caribbean, they, they, they just got punished for that. Um, that. This one is just called hands. So, um, so sometimes I just decide to play the dichotomy between civilization and barbarism, and where you don't know who is the barbarian and who is civilized. Uh, here I have Superman, as, uh, who is the perfect alien from out of space. Uh, as a pilgrim, uh, talking to a uh, Gnostic god, the god of rain, uh, Tlaloc. And uh, it's hard to see in the, here, but right here there's a UFO uh, with uh, the Aztec god uh, Quetzalcoatl in his duality of life and death. Um, this one is called Xenophobic Nightmare. 
Oh, the governor's nightmare, I'm sorry. The, 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 that's the one. This is when Pete Wilson uh, had that um, uh, a Proposition 187 where children of undocumented immigrants should not be eligible for school or services. So I decided just to make um, a Pete Wilson right here in the middle. And I decided to play the stereotype of the Aztec uh, savage. Um, and on the upper left corner, I have this other uh, kind of, another kind of cannibalistic uh, uh, image. Um, you know, if you are Catholic, you could go to communion, you know that in communion you are eating the flesh of God and drinking his blood in the communion. So uh, from that perspective, this thing is just kind of like a communion as well with uh, Pete Wilson. Uh, this one is called uh, Xenophobic Nightmare in a Foreign Language. Um, the translation, of, this is Africans, that where they speak in South Africa. I made this right before uh, the end of apartheid in South Africa. And it translates as, uh, I want to wake up now. So, um, so these are like some of the images of reverse anthropology. I uh, see a lot of the Spaniards build up uh, churches on top of pyramids. Uh, so they were imposing, you know, Renaissance architecture over pre-Columbian architecture. So I'm doing the opposite here. Uh, so I'm imposing pre-Columbian designs on European work. Uh, this is a, a piece by Rembrandt, The Lady with Fun. So that was a whole series I did on, on uh, a book that I found in the flea market. Uh, this is the end of the death of Columbus. Um, right here. So this is a collaboration I did with a Filipino artist. Uh, and this has a long story. This will take me 15 minutes. Uh, I lost this painting in the freeway. I recovered it, patched it back. Um, it was commissioned by the San Jose Museum. Then uh, it was rejected because they thought it was too angry. Uh, we painted little, uh, you know, like this bunny rabbit to tell them that we're not really angry here. Uh, <laughs> it, we uh, actually, I painted a little kitty cat here. I don't know if you could see it. Uh, I had butterflies going along here. And um, so uh, they didn't put it in the exhibition, but they pay us. We exchanged, we gave other works. I made this painting with Manuel Ocampo, who's a Filipino artist. He's just, uh, he's, he's worse than me. So they got a double whammy. But the thing is, the, the, the critics uh, were disappointed that the painting were not, was not in the show. And then they wrote a whole page saying that this painting should have been in that exhibition. It was an exhibition of contemporary artists who deal with religious imagery. Um, so I'm going to just move over uh, because I really will not have time. This is more reverse anthropology uh, books. I did this when I was living in France. This is the origin of the world or two origins of the world. The Aztecs have an abstract idea of the origins of the world in color, um, blue, white, black, and red for the four different directions of the universe in their mythology. So I painted so like a you know, minimalist painting uh, Aztec. Um, more reverse anthropology. I live in Giverny for a few months and I could not escape painting the Giverny gardens. So here's a uh, Picasso self-portrait being attacked by an African sculpture. And in French on the top, you say the times could go uh, fast or slowly. And um, more reverse anthropology. This is uh, my cannibal soup uh, brand. Uh, they might like to sell this in the cafe here. Um, and all of them have uh, recipes in the back. This is how you eat anthropologists with noodles. Oh, you, you don't see the whole thing. I'll read it for you. Anthropologists with noodles and your favorite sandwich, a quick and simple meal that's fun to eat. Add a delicious bowl of America's favorite anthropologists with noodle soup with lots of yummy noodles to your favorite sandwich. Eating anthropologists anthropology is so much fun, you're sure to smile. So, um, so I made a whole set. All, all of them have recipes in the back. So I have artist brains with rice, cream of dealer, art historian alphabet, fundraisers adobo, museum director stripe, Models meat, anthropologists with noodles, collectors broth, curators liver, critics tongue, my favorite. <laughs> um, uh, you could see a lot of these prints uh, right now at an exhibition at uh, Harvey Meadows Gallery. 
uh, nearby. So if you, you go there, you probably could see better those uh, than here. But um, I had a, you know, this is a print I did after I have a bicycle accident and I got a little concussion after I fall. I guess I was just thinking too much art talk, like you might see here. So um, more forgeries. Um, this is about the birth of death from a Mexican book that was censored by the Holy Inquisition on the grounds that this was a book that's called The Portentous Life of Death. And the Holy Inquisition said, death cannot be alive, therefore this book should not be published. So this is death when, uh, when she was a little baby. And the parents. Uh, all right. So um, I'm going to start a little bit talking about the destruction of uh, uh, there was a cultural side during the conquest uh, in, in all of the Americas, but in Mexico, particularly was sad because uh, the, the biggest library in the continent was burned. Uh, Mexico had uh, these uh, pre-Columbian cultures, like Mayans, the Mixtec Zapotec in Oaxaca, and the Aztecs, who had thousands of books. And uh, there was the library in the kingdom of Texcoco, uh, which is an Aztec kingdom uh, built by uh, King Netzahualcoyotl. It translates as the feather coyote. And King Netzahualcoyotl was against human sacrifices. You will never hear this uh, from uh, you know, a Mel Gibson movie like Apocalypto. Uh, you know, there, at the peak of the Aztec empire, there was an Aztec king who was against human sacrifice. Uh, King Netza, for sure. King Netza organized poetry festivals. He built up the largest library in the continent. And luckily for him, he died just about two years before Columbus arrived to the Americas. So he never encountered the Spaniards. <coughs> but when the Spaniards arrived to Mexico City and conquer, uh, they discovered the library. And they, uh, according to the accounts, all the books were piled up and burned in a, in a fire. There was a mass suicide of Indians. Uh, they could not stop them killing themselves. They hang themselves from trees, from the jump off pyramids. Um, and uh, it was a really tragic, a big tragedy. Today, there is a zero uh, Aztec books that survived the conquest. All of them were burned. There are Aztec books painted by indigenous artists immediately after the conquest, within the first 10 years after the conquest. That are uh, more following the influence of Renaissance, and they are more in, in, um, in Latin words and characters. Um, but also, there was a lot of resistance to, 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 to become a Christian, Christianized. And here, this is a drawing done by an indigenous, by an Aztec artist, anonymous artist, uh, Aztec, describing the execution of indigenous leaders who refused to become Christian. Uh, the writer uh, Eduardo Galeano has a great story that says, um, uh, it tells the story of an Indian who, who was about to be executed. He was about to be burned. And the Spanish priest and soldiers asked him to convert to Christianity so he could go to heaven. And the Indian said, well, are you all going to heaven? And they said, yes, we are all going to heaven. And the Indian said, well, I don't want to go to heaven. So uh, anyway, so um, I did a painting based on that later. But... Uh, but based on all this story of the destruction of books, I began to do my own versions of books. The Aztecs, by the way, they burn books of other cultures that they conquer. So it's, uh, uh, you know, that's maybe what made the conquest easier because all the indigenous people they were oppressing joined the Spaniards and they all fought against the, the Aztecs. The Aztecs were like the USA of the ancient Mesoamerica. So they were, you know, they controlled the world, but everybody hated them. Um, so uh, here it is. Um, I, I'm going to see if I could just enlarge it. I'm sorry, I'm going to lose a little bit from the edges. But um, this is a, a codex I did a few years ago about the economic collapse. So this is all about the economy. Um, nothing can have an intrinsic value. The value of a thing is just as much as it will bring. So that's my background in economics that comes through through this book. Let's see if I can read anything else. I don't know, it's a, it's a big economic tsunami. It's affecting everybody. Um, so now I'm gonna show you uh, the book that got me in trouble here in Colorado. This is uh, The Misadventures of the Romantic Cannibals. And I'm sorry for this JPEG, it's really bad. So um, 
So um, back here on the left is the page that just got reproduced uh, in Fox News saying, you know, this uh, Jesus having uh, oral sex. So uh, I guess uh, they really imagine things because first of all, there is no na nakedness at all. They, they mean the and I told them, you just, they didn't ask my intentions of it. Uh, first of all, I made this book when the pedophilia scandal took place in 2002 with you know, the priest molesting children. And also, you know, I, I felt irrit irritated with the homophobia that comes out of the church. I have a, a lot of gay and lesbian friends everywhere. I have gay and lesbian uh, faculty uh, colleagues at school. I have gay and lesbian students of mine. I have a gay couple across the street that sings religious songs in a church in San Francisco. Uh, you know, I, my life with that or, or friends will be boring and, and gray. So I always take, uh, uh, my wife and I, you know, uh, take uh, great pride in our friends. And we have gone to their weddings. I mean, uh, we cry in their weddings. They've been beautiful. When there is a short time when in San Francisco marriage was possible, we went to some. So I just felt this this hypocrisy within the church uh, that I wish they could correct it. Lately, you know, they came with their self study saying that the reason why priests were molesting kids was because um, uh, the 60s were too permissive. Uh, so. Um, what about before the 60s? So, yeah. But anyway, so um, I have shown this many times in San Francisco. It was shown at the Denver Art Museum for four months. Nobody complained. It went to a small town like Loveland, and uh, it, it, it created a whole protest. And uh, pre a, a pastor from Loveland asked me to explain my book to him. So I told him what I just told you. And, and he, he liked my explanation. He said, thank you for your thoughtful explanation. If you ever come to Loveland, it will be an honor to meet you. And I say, wow, I say, uh, I wish the most Christians were like you. And we became friends. Uh, he was defending my work against his own congregation. His name is uh, Pastor Jonathan Wiggins. And then um, he asked me, because I told him, you know, to me this uh, book, uh, I'll go back, uh, uh, the book is, um, it used my way to, to express corruption of the spiritual, if anything. The best ideals in humanity get corrupted by power. And if anything, that's what's going on. Uh, for me, there is no real Christ here. It's just uh, collage uh, from comic books and, and religious icons, but it's not uh, the real icon itself. So he accepted that. So he asked me, would you do a non-corrupt image of uh, Jesus for my church? And I told him, well, I'm not religious myself. Um, and nobody knows how Jesus looked like. Uh, you know, these are different representations of Christ from different cultures. There's like, you know, um, uh, Chinese, uh, there's uh, Russian, uh, there's Japanese, there's um, Ethiopian, there's Euro European, there's the Mexican Christ. None of them look alike. And I told him, my Christ is not gonna look like any Christ either. And so, but if your congregation wants it, I will do it for free. <laughs> and I thought he's gonna go back to his congregation and say, no, forget it, this is such a atheist crazy guy, don't take it from him. <laughs> but no, instead his congregation accepted with a standing ovation. In between though, before all this, I was just already having this conversation with him. Uh, somebody just came, drove all the way from, um, from Montana to Loveland with a crowbar and destroyed the book. Uh, and, Everyone got just crazy. I got just a wave of hate mail. Um, nobody asked me what the meaning behind the work was. Uh, the media, especially Fox News, was very focused on uh, just sensationalist description, like you know, Christ having sex, basically. No word about the pedophilia, about uh, why, why I did this book. Uh, no word about my disenchantment with the homophobia in the church. Uh, or what the church did destroying pre-Columbian cultures, which is also behind the multiple stories behind this book. They just focus on one page. Um, so uh, when the congregation accepted my offer, I decided, well, okay, so I'm just gonna do it. So I began to do my, 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 my versions of uh, Christ. So I did the underpainting and um, so I sent it to the congregation. They really liked it. And I just finished the, the painting um, about two weeks ago. Uh, I put color on it. On it. And uh, let's see if it moves. 
All right, so. And, and I'm sorry, it's a really big file. I might have to get off um, for a minute uh, of the slideshow and show you the whole painting here. You could see it uh, more clearly. Uh, yeah, but totally distorting the work and totally trashing it. And they didn't ask me. They didn't, I, I, I wish I had been uh, in the same show. Uh, they only offered me their website, and then on the website, I just got hate mail, basically. It was not, it was not a rational discussion. Luckily, I have a really good discussion with, with a pastor. So um, let, me, um, let me select more words because we're running out of uh, time. So um, I'm just going to show you maybe some uh, other books that I did, uh, uh, some books that I did about the economy. Um, those are, these, are, these books, I show them in the uh, Biennale in Australia, the Sydney Biennale just last year, The Enlightened Savage Guide to Economic uh, Theory. So I'm going to go through the pages of all this book. Uh, I, I use uh, pictures from the money from uh, Australia, uh, you know, some of the, the people who benefit from all this crisis uh, having fun. Um, different types of currency and money, gold, uh, the original accumulation of capital, I guess. Um, uh, brains as commodity. Uh, you could interpret in many directions my books. I don't really have a specific linear uh, narrative. Uh, that's what's behind the money. Um, so I, I use the Australian flag in the, in the background. Let's see if I could. Uh, so with all the stereotypical Aboriginal character here. Um, this is another book I did, Surviving Paradise, a novel, Savage Guy. This is a little bit about global warming. So these are just my most recent works uh, from the last uh, couple of years. I made this before the tsunami in Japan, so that's pretty weird that this happened. I made this a uh, few, few months before. Um, so I'm just going to pass through several pictures. This is another drawing I did. Um, this is called uh, Roadmap with Alice in Wonderland uh, uh, having a dialogue here with uh, Military Jesus helicopter. <laughs> so like a delicate balance between the secular and the religious, which just I cannot have to experience myself in my life. Um, so a lot of these uh, charcoal drawings are almost, it, they are based on the concept of editorial cartooning. It's a nuclear, nuclear face. The only happy thing here is this guy, is where is Waldo? And uh, <laughs> this is a very tiny man in, in my drawing, he's uh, totally smiling. Um, this is about our dependency on fossil fuels. And, but that's the way my cats run in our house also. So <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, somebody asked me if uh, this drawing was about uh, George Bush father and George Bush son. I say, no, maybe this is about how history repeats itself. Um, if I wanted to do George Bush, I would do it like, yeah, like this. <laughs> so um, it's, we could see the whole thing. Um, yeah. Um, so I guess I don't need to say who's who. Uh, Osama bin Laden was the witch in the back. Um, some people say it's a self-portrait, don't listen to them. Those are Fox News people. Uh, um, so um, I did more forgeries uh, after Philip Gaston, who's another of my favorite artists from all times. I wish I had met him. So uh, I made a series after a series of uh, satires that he did on Richard Nixon. So I just replaced the face of Richard Nixon by that of George Bush. Let's see if you could see it all. Uh, And so he's trying to see ideas, if they have any, um, the other way around. And uh, notice the gun here. I, that's um, in the original Philip Gaston is a golf club. And I did this before the elections of 2004. And I swear, I didn't know that George, I mean, that um, the vice president, uh, Cheney, uh, was going to shoot a friend of his a few months after I did this drawing. So he did. 
So sometimes it's scary for me that my drawings turn a little bit uh, a premonition of uh, dark events that are about to happen. Okay, more of the same series. It's like uh, trying to read Arabic after they destroy it. Uh, for opportunity with my former provost, uh, um, Condi. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, the worst attacks on this country happened when they were having a vacation. And the word Billy is after Billy Graham, who played a big influence on George Bush to turn him into a, a, a non-alcoholic and a Christian. But also he played a, a role in Richard Nixon as well, so I didn't have to change the word Billy. And this is my portrait of uh, Richard Bush or George Nixon. Uh, again, here is uh, the Border Patrol uh, trying to arrest death and saying, I command you to surrender. That's what uh, it reads here. And then death is saying, okay. And it's just, <laughs> she's having champagne here celebrating uh, illegal immigration. One thing I want to say about illegal immigration, I think, um, uh, you know, the first illegal aliens, I always think, were the pilgrims and the conquistadors because they came to America without a passport. And they were you know, going against the law of the land in many indigenous nations. Uh, but you know, many of them were escaping repression in Europe. They were economic refugees. Uh, so that's why I have this elegy to illegal immigration, actually. Because for me, uh, the contemporary, quote unquote, illegal aliens are, for me, the contemporary pilgrims. And this country keeps getting richer from, from that influence. I hope at some point all these legal issues get resolved. Um, but most of these paintings are based on that and on how people build borders between themselves. Um, this is after George Bingham, a painter who painted raft boats in, in um, the Mississippi River. So, but here they might be crossing the border uh, in the Rio Grande. Um, and, but it's uh, immigrants from everywhere, you know, illegal aliens having a big party. Sorry about that. Go to the next. Uh, this is how Cubans are crossing the ocean. Uh, they build up rafts uh, and they make uh, the, this was the very first one they did, a GM truck that propels. And uh, they stopped them, got the truck. There was a museum that wanted that truck they sunk the truck, they sent the Cubans back, uh, but they came back twice and the third time they stay actually. And I hope they get a job at GM because they're really good at making amphibious uh, vehicles. <laughs> and we need that, you know, with global warming, you know, a lot of uh, cities are gonna need amphibious cars, especially on the coast. Um, I, sometimes I play with abstraction, you know, before I was a figu figurative artist, uh, I was a non-representational artist, so sometimes I play like that. So this is my self-portrait. I am a procrastinator. And um, it uh, could be my self-portrait as a lazy Mexican. <laughs> you know, don't do today what you can do tomorrow. I just sit with my cats, <laughs> read the paper, watch TV. Um, two, uh, two illegal aliens, one in the army, one as a janitor. Uh, it's interesting, in the army in Iraq, there's a lot of undocumented immigrants. And very often, they come out and they actually get uh, papers by, by going that path. Uh, but it's interesting how they are trusted there. People trust them with their lives. But here, there's all this xenophobic uh, wave that I hope it passes away, because mostly politicians, rhetoric, uh, most of the people that I know don't have issues with xenophobia. And I think I'm just going to end my 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 lecture because it's uh it's almost the end uh this is a bill i did after the um the first crisis i um, uh, is the united states of america it's a federal you know uh, federal bailout note and um, this is what the debt was about a year ago right now it's about 14 or almost 15 uh, trillion dollars i bet this brought to you by neocon economics and uh, this is about the share per household. And I told the, the publisher, the only problem is this, this print is dated now. So what we did was a digital version. Right now we have a digital version where this is digital and it's updating itself every second. And it plays music in the background, so we put it with NPR in the background. It's the most anxiety-provoking piece I have ever done. I don't even want to have that in my house. 
Um, that's a print I did here in Colorado about a year ago, Illegal Aliens Guide to Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And this is about pollution, social pollution, political pollution, real, you know, ecological pollution. And the size of the country is based on the size of the pollution they, they produce. You could notice Africa is very small, US, uh, you know, uh, China, Russia, you know, they are like on the top. Uh, another charcoal drawing after the, uh, the economic collapse, this one is called Too Big. And that little character, this was a, a, a crisis that affected mostly middle class uh, and poor, uh, working class. But here this guy on the far right side, it says, hello, my name is Fuck Off. And I, I think uh, <laughs> a, a, the, the guy, uh, the, the, the figure left could be, you know, a Wall Street, Wall Street character, who knows. Um, this is uh, a, maybe a former billionaire that became a millionaire overnight. Um, they are playing golf here. I don't know if you could read a little bit of the grotesque speed and invention in the making come to seem a part of the meaning. Uh, that's what it says here. And then here when I'm gonna read for you, let me see if I could enlarge it. The word thematizes a certain lingering between heterogeneity, heterogeneity and the monomaniacal. Sorry for my English. Um, the happy um, interaction between rich and poor. I made an itching lately that is called uh, My Cat Lulu's um, Utopia. And I did this as a project for the New School of Social Research last year. So this was part of a big, big installation. It was a tribute to Orozco. These drawings are based after uh, Jose Clemente Orozco, a muralist. So this is kind of like a tribute to, to Orozco. And then the last works I'm gonna show you are more meditational. After all this controversy, I went to, I, I went to a mood where I just wanted to meditate, do nothing that people would read. Here in the background, you see the Holy Family. Here you could barely see it. So these are called ghostly meditations. And here I have, I had a dream that I keep forgetting the more I try to recall it. I think a lot of uh, people have had that same dream. I don't know if you had it, I had it. <laughs> You wake up, you try to remember, and it erases furthermore. Uh, there is no narrative in this piece. Um, today, still forever, it's kind of a meditational um, state. Here you could see sort of like a clock in the ears of this guy. I took this, these are drawn in the back of the paper, by the way. Uh, these are offsets of, I, the etchings I was using before have like facing pages. So this is the facing page. So you see the, the lady with a fan that I did my first reverse anthropology drawing. This is the, the facing page. So I painted over this one too. Um, and in the back of the, it's very thin paper. So I draw in the back of the paper so you get all these transparencies. Um, here you're looking into a good thought. Uh, let me see if I could enlarge, see what's happening in the middle. Uh, not much. So, um, this one is the artist is out meditating and will be back shortly. Uh, this is a couple that just had a baby. Uh, I don't know if you can see the baby here. Um, um, and this is the here and now, another meditational element. And here you have um, Obama here on the, on the bottom. And this one, it said, I am lev levitating in my dreams, but I will wake up soon. Um, then there is no statement in this work. Also, I have Tarzan and Jane and Cheetah. In a background, it's sort of like a jungly. And this is the end of my talk. Uh, don't follow me. <laughs> I am lost too. Um, this is another Cuban raft, by the way. That's a really great Cuban raft. You might see it here. But. Anyways, thank you very much, and I'm sorry I have to rush this. Thank you.